I've seen the lineup of speakers today, and I know many of them, and it looks like a, a very exciting lineup of, of talks and about big data, and it's a very exciting industry to be a part of. And uh, I'd like to kick off uh, today with a, a talk on the future of data. Um, I was uh, having a phone call conversation uh, last week, actually, with uh, Mike Olson. And Mike Olson is a founder of Cloudera. He's one of uh, several founders that we have. And he's also kind of a, a rock star in Silicon Valley. Uh, he used to work at Oracle. And before that, he also uh, helped create the Berkeley database. Uh, so he, he's been in the database world for a long time. And we were talking about some of the things that Cloudera is working on that's outside of our core business. And one of those things kind of struck me a little odd. And, he was telling me that uh, Cloudera is investing in uh, nonprofit organizations. And we're helping nonprofit organizations leverage their data with Hadoop and, and kind of get on the boat with Hadoop. And I, I thought that was great. And you know, I like to hear that our company is doing good for the community and doing good for humanity. Because a lot of these organizations are doing cancer research or helping supply medicines or food for, for people who, who don't have access to that. But I, as a businessman, I, I kind of had to ask the question, why? You know, why would we do this? Uh, you know, what's, there's got to be a catch. There's got to be a, a business reason behind it. And his answer really surprised me. You know, he said, it's our responsibility. I thought to myself, okay, why is it our responsibility to, to, to help this? I mean, I, I get it, but it's our responsibility because Cloudera is innovating with the rest of the world, with our competitors, in such a way that we're changing the way businesses think about data. And we're revolutionizing products and businesses all across the world. And it's our responsibility to help these nonprofits get on the same boat with everyone else, because they can't afford to do so, and to leverage their data to continue to, to help humanity and do what they're trying to do best. And he was very passionate about it. And I could tell that you know, he, he really believed that this is a revolution and this is what we're, we're building right now. And we're, we're changing everything about data right now. And, you know, I really, really like to hear that. But it also kind of was a little bit funny to me because this slide here has been kind of an introductory slide for my talk for now almost two years. I give different talks. And I've always thought it was, it was just a marketing slide. But it, it's actually real. And we, we are revolutionizing the way people think about data. And every one of you all are, are being impacted by that. I mean, there's products that you all now consider part of daily life that are leveraging big data. And when you think about what a revolution is, uh, the Industrial Revolution is really the biggest one that comes to mind when you think about an explosion of innovation. What happened there was you had companies who were able to produce products faster and cheaper for consumers. But you also had consumers who got products cheaper and were better products or better services. So it was a win-win situation for both sides. And that created an explosion of innovation for the Industrial Revolution. And that's exactly what's happening today with big data and the data revolution. Let me tell you about one of our, our customers. And I really like this customer, Opower. So Opower has built a platform on top of Hadoop and Cloudera. And what they do is they help consumers like you all analyze your energy consumption. So if you're at home and you turn on your dryer, you'll know how much that costs you. If you leave lights on during the day, you'll know how much that costs you. If you leave your stove on or things like that, everything you use, Opower helps you understand that which that allows you, as a consumer, to reduce your utility bills. Okay, that's great, you're, you set, you're saving money. Well, what it also allows Opower to do is it allows Opower to have more electricity to distribute, driving prices down for all of you, and also able to incent customers who are actually using tools like this uh, by offering lower prices if you stay below th certain thresholds. So in the sense, both the company the utility company in this case, and the consumer are benefiting this. And this is one example of, of why we're in the middle of, of a data revolution. 
And on top of all that, everyone's reducing their carbon footprint that's involved in that. So we're not only saving money, getting a better product, but we're also helping the environment. And it's companies like this that really get me excited about the future of big data. Uh, data is everywhere. Big data is in every industry, every market, every sector. You see it everywhere, okay? Some of it is, is new to us, and some of it has now become part of mainstream and part of our daily life. For example, uh, if you were watching maybe the last episode of Game of Thrones last night, uh, you might be wondering, you know, what, what, what TV show should I take on next? Well, you know, there's, there's a service that will be gladly recommend one to you based upon everyone else that watched Game of Thrones and liked it or didn't like it. And so that's true not only for, for TV shows, but for movies and for books. And if you go shopping online, you'll get recommended products. These are things that we consider mainstream, but are based upon big data. Another industry is the automotive industry. So you may be driving your car, right? And you're driving too close to the car in front of you, right? And all of a sudden it starts beeping and annoying you, and it notices that you, you may possibly have an accident. How do they know that? They knew that with big data, because they've analyzed the traffic from all of their cars, from all of their customers, and figured out when their customers have accidents and what mistakes they're making. And then they've gone and programmed these devices to let you know as a consumer that you're about to have an accident. In addition, the automotive, automotive industry has put little smart devices in all of the parts, and this is the manufacturing part of it. And so if you have a problem in your car, uh, it may actually call, call back to one of our customers, if you're a Mitsubishi customer, um, it may actually call back to Mitsubishi and tell you, hey, you need to go take your car to get serviced uh, because one of your parts, your transmission or something's about to go out. And it'll proactively tell you, before you're stuck out there on the highway uh, with a car problem, it'll tell you that you need to take your car in to get serviced. Uh, another, you know, manufacturing is everywhere and it's, it's uh, in the oil and gas, it's in the airplane industry, and they're also putting smart devices in their parts. And they're helping save you know, the environment in the sense that, I mean, if we all remember the BP oil accident. Well, well companies like BP are putting smart devices in their, in their oil uh, rigs and, and their, their uh, devices and things that monitor everything so that they can prevent accidents like that in the future. Airplanes, uh, manufacturers such as Boeing, are putting smart devices in their uh, planes so that they can predict when things need maintenance so that you're not delayed on the runway or, or even worse. And so we're seeing uh, this in every industry and it, it's revolutionizing the way all businesses think. Another great example is you know, uh, law enforcement. Well, we see the news about terrible things that happened in Paris or Brussels. Well, they're using big data to track down those criminals and to track down those terrorists and to figure out where they are and who they're connected to and what network they're part of and how they communicate. Uh, Hadoop is being leveraged to do all kinds of things across the world. <laughs> and that's why you know, it's a very exciting industry and it's, it's really revolutionizing the way we think. But why is data suddenly big? I mean, there's nothing new other than we have new products. I mean, data, we had data 10 years ago. I get this question a lot. Why is data so big? Well, I bet many of you probably um, came in here on public transport. Uh, there were probably sensors on those transport that were calculating how many people uh, boarded or deboarded, potentially also sensors that are helping keep it on time so that you weren't late for the conference. As you walked in, there was probably video cameras taking surveillance of people. Okay. Uh, many of you may be sending a tweet right now talking about the conference, hopefully saying good things. Um, th th there may be uh, a live video stream of this on Facebook. I mean, I was at a conference a couple weeks ago that was doing that. Um, you know, you're posting a picture of you uh, later on at, at the conference and people are commenting on that. All of this is just happening right here with this group. And imagine, you know, the whole world actively using all of these, these means. So we have the, the cell phone, the, the Android and the iPhone. And now, 
you know, 10 years ago, if you were you know, needing to read the news, you probably would have to wait till after this conference and you'd go back to your home or your desk. But now you, you, can, you can read the news right now while I'm talking. Um, and you know, so the mobile device has created an explosion of internet traffic <coughs> that all can be analyzed. Then you add in the social, you know, Twitter and Facebook. You add in the ability to take video and photographs and analyze those. Right. Huge amounts of data. I just uh, read on the, in the news yesterday, there's a, there's a Russian application that if you've used the Russian Facebook site and you've posted just one picture of yourself, right, anyone could go to a concert and take a picture and they could identify you uh, with a 70% accuracy, and this is their first release of software, simply by matching your one picture that you posted on the Russian Facebook. So the, the ability to analyze video and photos is, is rapidly increased. And then we're seeing it you know, in the hands of everyone today and not just you know, in the hands of the government. But you as a developer can write programs right now to do interesting things like that. Um, and then you, know, you combine the Internet of Things, uh, which is creating sensors that are, are in, everywhere and everything and they're measuring, all, they're me measuring data all over the place. And so when you add in all of that, uh, and all of this has come up, come really to life in the past 10 years, you see a huge amount of increase in data. Right? We, we did a study, and over the past 10 years, data has doubled every year for 10 years. And if you look at that chart, most of it's unstructured data. It's data that, you know, I guess multi-structured is probably a better form or better word, but it's in some non-standard format uh, that can't just be stuffed into a database. And so it's, it's data that we have to figure out how to leverage. And this has all come about in the past 10 years. So when we think about what we do today, what most companies do today, the established way of analyzing all this data right here is really just this relational part, right? And that's why it's, it's, it's interesting that the yellow part is linear, right? And the reason why is it's limited, okay? The way things are done today is mostly termed as enterprise data warehousing. And many of you may be familiar with that or involved in it directly. Uh, it's a very established way of, of analyzing data, large amounts of data. But it wasn't designed for this amount of data. It wasn't designed for petabytes of data. And I'll give you a few reasons. The first main reason is cost. So if you're going to have an enterprise data warehouse, most likely you're going to, going to use a software provider like Oracle. Uh, Oracle's not cheap. Oracle's very, very expensive. You may have to go out and buy NAS because you want your data to be redundant and reliable and you want to be able to scale your system. And that's very, very expensive hardware. We did a study of, of the operational cost of data. And to have data in an enterprise data warehouse with an Oracle and a NAS, it costs 100 times more than it costs Hadoop. 100 times more. So what does that cause? I mean, well, maybe you have a lot of money as a company, or maybe you don't. But what it actually causes is no matter how much money you have to work with, you still have to make decisions about what data you want to keep. You have to say, you know, this data that's five years old, I don't need it anymore. I'm going to archive it off. We call that dark data. Okay? You have to make these decisions. And I don't know about you, but I don't know what I want tomorrow. I mean, I think I know what I want today, but I definitely don't know what I want tomorrow. And so it's very hard to make those decisions. And so you've taken this huge amount of data, and you've now reduced it to a, from a cloud to a box, because you can only afford to keep that amount of data. So that's the first fundamental problem with enterprise data warehousing is that that cost decision is always having to be made. The next thing that happens is, you know, the business analysts that are really trying to work with the company and advance the company and, uh, and you know, give them a competitive edge by looking at this data, maybe answering a question like, you know, if someone just watched a comedy uh, and, uh, and they, they gave it five stars, what movie should I recommend them next? 
And that business analyst is working with data engineers uh, to look at what data they have available in this box and, and figure out how to load it into a bunch of relational tables so that they can then get their answers. There's a problem with that. It's, it's very, very time consuming. I mean, you're having to wait on a whole ETL process to, to transform data, which by the way, transformation in itself, you lose data, so that box just got smaller. And then you have this delay, uh, and you have a backlog of other data analysts that are trying to get their data loaded in, in a proper format and transformed. And so it's, it's like if you're an engineer and you're, you're writing code and you check in something and then you have to wait two hours to see the how it worked. You don't want to do that, right? I mean, that's just that's unacceptable as a developer, right? So it's also the same bottleneck that's happening in enterprise data warehousing. So as a result, people find other ways to do it, right? So you create a data silo, uh, which is a smaller version of your data that you have more control over, and you don't have to wait on the, the, the business processes, and you can get your answers faster. The problem, though, is you just created a duplicate of that data. It's probably even a smaller box. And now, all of a sudden, you're getting your answers to your questions on a very small subset of data that could be old, and could be outdated because you're not connected to that main silo of data. And so you then create a problem where enterprises have multiple copies of this data, they don't know how to update it when it changes, and it just becomes a chaotic mess. And so fundamentally, the way things are done today is, is just not gonna hold up, it's not gonna work with the amount of data that we have today. So what you need is a modern architecture, something that was designed from the beginning to support this kind of data. When Doug Cutting founded Hadoop, he was working with Yahoo, and, and they thought about this from the very, very beginning. They wanted to index every single page in the internet. And this was eight, nine years ago. And the internet was quite large, and they wanted to keep this data forever and continuously index every page, every day. And they designed a system that could do this redundantly and cheaply, and, and, and that's Hadoop. So the first way Hadoop solves the problems of enterprise data warehousing is it makes it affordable, okay? You don't have to go buy that expensive hardware for a couple reasons. Uh, one is Hadoop was designed to scale infinitely, right, and to also uh, be redundant in the, in the sense that you can plug in different pieces of hardware uh, that's industry standard hardware and not premium, super expensive hardware. And you don't have to, to have all this, this expensive stuff and you can, can grow as you need. So you don't have to think, okay, in five years, I'm gonna need 100 petabytes of data. You can, you can think about just what you need next month and you can continually grow your, your data lake as you need it in an affordable way at one hundredth of the cost. So that eliminates for most companies the need to make that decision about what data do I need today. You can just put all of your data into your data lake, allowing your business analysts to examine all of that data at once and it's redundant and you're not going to lose it. In addition, because it's centralized, uh, you, you, you no longer have these silos that are happening, right? Uh, you, you've, you've created a situation where the data analysts right, have access to all the data and they can get their answers very quickly. And the reason why is the technology allows for different ways to store the data, okay? In the, in the relational world, you don't get to break out the Oracle database and plug in a new storage system or plug in a new search system. You don't, you don't get to do that. You, you have a black box and, and that's it. In Hadoop, I mean, if you, if you have a real-time use case and, and you have data constantly flowing in and you're never updating that, you can choose a storage system that matches that use case. And so it's, it's designed in such a way that you have good access to all of your data. You have HDFS, you have HBase, you have a variety of ways you can store it and you don't have to go through that transformation process that causes all these delays, but then causes people to create silos. And so the benefits of a do far outweigh you know, anything that we've seen that can handle this amount of data. 
And the great news about Hadoop is it's an open platform. You can see how, how much innovation has happened. You know, in 2006, there were two components that Doug Cuddy created. And now we have over 30 components. You know, just last year, Cloudera announced Kudu. Uh, but there's lots of, of components. And, you know, how does the open platform help you? I'll give you an example. Facebook, Facebook had a lot of engineers that really only knew SQL. Okay? And they didn't want to replace all of those engineers with people who knew Hadoop. That just wasn't, that didn't make business sense. So they, given this was an open platform, they had access to all the source code, and they went out and created a, 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 a component called Hive. And what Hive does is it maps SQL to a MapReduce job. That allowed their SQL developers or their SQL engineers uh, to still do what they knew best, but do it on top of Hadoop. And the openness and the open platform that exists in Hadoop allowed Facebook to do that. And that's, that's a big example of a company that really had the means to do it. But a, a smaller example would be, you know, if, if you had a specialized use case. I know two companies here in Budapest uh, that are working on Spark and Flink, that they have specialized use cases that they've taken the source code of Spark and they've changed it to support their specific use case, and they have their own version of Spark. And they've employed people here in Budapest to help write that. And they're not limited you know, to that black box that the commercial vendor is providing. If they have something special that they need, they can hire some of you all, and they can make that happen. And that's a, one of the many benefits of an open platform. Another one is, you know, there's gonna be some, some price control here, in the sense that you know, in the, in the world of enterprise software, if, if you're on an Oracle server, it's very, very difficult to get off. And Oracle can just continue raising that price until it becomes practically unaffordable for you. But an open platform, Cloudera always has the threat that there could be another company that could come in and, and cut our, our prices. I mean, because it's an open platform and, and the source and the IP is right there, you know, we have a lot of competitive advantages of of how we can support you as a customer and, and the training that we provide and the services. But the IP is available. And so that will help over the long term keep the price of Hadoop affordable for those companies that are buying commercial support. But even better, you as engineers can download it and learn about it and educate yourself on it and innovate in it without any cost. It's completely free. But everything's not rosy yet. Many of you may have been working on big data projects and being frustrated. You're not alone. Okay, Gartner, a, a business analyst company in the United States, estimates that in 2017, 60% of pilots will fail. That's a big number, 60%. And 90% of data lakes, so we're talking about Hadoop here, data lakes will be completely useless. So if you've been part of a project that hasn't been successful, you're not alone. And the reason why, this is hard stuff. This is not, this is not easy. And the questions we're asking that are revolutionizing the way businesses think, they're not easy questions. And so it takes a lot of work to get there. And we're still very early in this technology adoption cycle. If you look at this chart, this is a famous adoption cycle that all business schools use. First mark, a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley estimates that we're right around 15% adoption of big data. That means we're just past that early adopter phase. I don't know if you all were early adopters of the iPhone or, or the Android, um, but if you were, you probably experienced many bugs, many applications that didn't work well. And you also couldn't do the things that you can do today. Uh, so early adopters are the ones that have taken on these projects and have probably failed several times before they finally learned how to do it. So we're just now entering that phase where we're going to see an explosion of companies that are trying it out. Uh, they've seen other companies be successful, uh, but they want 
to do it themselves. And it's still going to be a challenge. So what's around the corner? How do we get to that, that peak of that, that curve so that it's a mature platform? There's three things that you know, Cloudera is really working on. Um, but also the community itself, the open source community. The first is platform maturity. You know, over the past eight years, Hadoop has been maturing its infrastructure. And it's been maturing quite successfully. We're seeing things like Spark take over and, and help with a lot of the problems of the, the early versions of Hadoop. Uh, and we're seeing much faster search engines like Impala that can search 10, 100 times faster and then Hive. Uh, and we're seeing the product mature, and we're probably going to see some consolidation in the ecosystem of over 35 open source components. Uh, we're also going to see a lot of machine learning. Uh, because those 90% of those data lakes are useless right now. And so in order to really derive value from that, you have to understand machine learning and this is a new field for a lot of people. It could be called artificial intelligence. It's been renamed and kind of created in vogue as machine learning. Uh, but a lot of companies don't yet know how to do this. And so we've seen a lot of our customers who've created these data lakes, and now they're stuck. They don't know what to do. And so we're going to see advances to make machine learning easier. And we're going to see applications that make machine learning easier so that you can learn from your data lake much faster and with a, a, a lower skill set so that you don't have to go hire you know, the, the MIT grad uh, to learn something from your data, data lake. And then with any new technology, once the ma maturity of the infrastructure has settled, you begin to see application development. And we're already starting to see some of that where there are native big data applications that are running on top of Hadoop that solve very specific problems and make it easy on everyone. So once you see the applications kind of come into the picture, the, the need to know how the infrastructure works underneath becomes a lot less. And you work within the application layer as a developer. And that opens up the door for a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of exciting, exciting new ideas. And the good news is there are a ton of companies that are willing to help you besides Cloudera. So we have a lot of partners. We have over 100 different partners. Uh, there are, this is a, a chart that is not just Cloudera. It was also done by First Mark out of Silicon Valley. And it shows every vendor. It shows all the various applications and infrastructure and business anal analytics companies. And so if you need help, I mean, there, there, there are companies here today as well that, that can help you. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are involved in big data. And so it's a very exciting time. There's a lot of room to grow within both the platform and the applications above. And I want to end with one more real world use case. And I didn't mention healthcare earlier, but healthcare is my personal favorite, but also one of our biggest businesses and when you consider the verticals that we, we sell to. And it was also one of the very early adopters of, of Hadoop and big data. And the, the interesting thing about healthcare is, you know, they naturally have a lot of data. And they've been analyzing lots of data before this came along, but they, they were spending much, much more money. So a lot of things that we're doing for healthcare is really helping reduce the costs of doing what they did yesterday. Uh, there's a company called Cerner, and Cerner's doing two really exciting things. The first one is, if you have an illness or a condition that you have to go to the hospital for, Cerner works with hospitals to analyze all the, the patient records and look at, okay, you were admitted for this condition, you, this was your diagnosis, and now we're about, the hospital is about to release you. And Cerner helps that hospital determine what is the probability that you will return a week or two weeks later with the same condition, based upon patterns of people that match your diagnosis all across the world. That's amazing, because you know, one of the biggest problems when it comes to the cost of healthcare is, is you know, supporting the, the amount of rooms that they have to house people. 
And so for Cerner to enable hospitals to be much more efficient with how they, they house patients, uh, that helps lower the cost for everyone. But in addition, it saves you as a patient a lot of trouble if you go home and then a week later you're sick. But also, Cerner's taken that to one more level. They send you home with a, an Internet of Things device, right, that has a sensor and can monitor your blood. And one of the most common ways that people die is from blood infection called sepsis after they get released from the hospital. They, they had some surgery. Could have just been a routine surgery. Uh, but you go home and, and you get a blood infection and you don't get back to the hospital in time, and you come very, very sick and ill, and you potentially die. And at best case, you maybe had to call an ambulance, which may have cost you a lot of money. Well, Cerner sends you home with a device that can alert you and your doctors that you have blood sepsis right now, and that you need to immediately go to the hospital. And so they're helping save lives. And this is one of many ways that the healthcare industry is advancing. They have personalized medicine today that can look at all of the, the information about your genes and your history and recommend medicine on the spot. Things that used to take a month to be sent off to a lab, come back, you can get that right there in the hospital before you ever leave. And so the healthcare industry is probably the, my favorite industry that's using Hadoop and big data. You know, we, we have a you know, in Budapest, it's a, it's a very exciting place for, for big data. And I, I really think it has the potential and also very well positioned to be the epicenter of big data in Europe. There's lots of companies here today using big data. There's lots of great talent using big data. And, you know, I encourage you all to learn more about it and to ask yourself, if you're in a business, how can your company use big data? How can your company get ahead of its competitors by moving to Hadoop and learning more about the data that you already have or may potentially not even be keeping? And if you're an engineer out there, I encourage you to, to learn more about it, to contribute to the community. And this is a revolution that is changing the world, changing the products that we see every day and changing our lives and making things much better for everyone. And I encourage you to contribute to that community and, and to write code and to submit fixes to it. And also to potentially join some of the companies here that are part of Big Data in Budapest because there's a lot of opportunity with Big Data here in Budapest. And I'm going to end with that. Is there any questions?